uh, today we will uh, look at uh, the representation learning in a reinforcement learning lecture and uh, this is a concluding lecture of the course it uh, introduces very exciting topic uh, where where we will learn how to uh, leverage the unsupervised uh, learning to improve uh, the results in uh, uh, the specific field of reinforcement learning. And uh, this one is more like uh, an overview lecture and uh, it covers some topics in uh, uh, some detail and other topics are just uh, briefly mentioned. It uh, has like a lot of information packed here and uh, probably it one of the reasons for that is uh, that uh, kind of reinforcement learning is a field of study of uh, Peter Abiel, and uh, he has uh, done a lot of research in this field. It's uh, kind of one of the big names in reinforcement learning, and uh, yeah, so it this lecture contains a lot of interesting content and uh, many of the uh, results presented uh, here are co-authored by uh, the lecturer. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start with that. Just um, hmm. delay here, sorry. Sure. It looks like we have some problems lo loading the slides, um, but yeah, maybe let's go like this. So uh, first, uh, let's introduce uh, the reinforcement learning problem uh, that we are uh, trying to solve. So uh, we have an agent uh, which operates in the world, so in some environment, and uh, the goal uh, of reinforcement learning is to, uh, for agent to learn some policy uh, which would maximize a reward. Uh, and uh, here you can see the settings that agent uh, takes some actions. Those actions affect the environment and uh, the environment produces uh, some reward and also uh, change, changes its state uh, dep depending on the engine, uh, on the actions of the, of the agent. And uh, this is a very general uh, framework uh, which can be used uh, to formulate many problems uh, and uh, this uh, framework uh, and uh, reinforcement learning uh, as compared to uh, standard supervised learning uh, presents uh, a number of uh, challenges that are unique uh, to uh, to reinforcement learning. Uh, for uh, some examples, uh, you can see here that is a credit assignment. And uh, so uh, the rewards that we get from the environment uh, can be sparse. Uh, for example, uh, think about uh, playing chess. Uh, so uh, the distance in like time steps between the observing the outcome, so winning or losing a game, and uh, making a move might be uh, very long. And it is not trivial to uh, make a connection between uh, a certain move in the 
beginning of the game uh, to the outcome of the game. And uh, this presents a certain challenge. Uh, so first, uh, the fact that uh, the learning signal is uh, kind of this reward signal uh, can be delayed. And second, uh, that uh, we need to uh, figure out a way to attribute the rewards to uh, so how, how much each action in a, a sequence of actions contributed to getting a reward. So we, we might have uh, done a, a lot of uh, bad moves, but still got uh, a good reward. And uh, as you might suspect, this can introduce a lot of variance to the uh, learning process. Uh, so uh, the next uh, challenge uh, listed here is uh, stability. So uh, reinfor reinforcement learning uh, has certain uh, problems uh, with that. And uh, for some uh, settings, uh, there are no uh, like theoretical uh, uh, guarantees of convergence of the algorithms. And uh, specifically, this applies to uh, the case when we are trying to use uh, uh, like function approximation and off policy data and bootstrapping. And uh, this is essentially what we uh, want to use in many cases when we apply deep learning. And uh, a lot of like engineering uh, uh, tricks are used to overcome these challenges. Uh, so another challenge is exploration. So given uh, some uh, environment, uh, we uh, always are presented uh, with this uh, decision. Uh, so we have uh, some idea what the reward uh, for uh, taking some action would be. And uh, we want to take actions in a way that uh, we will maximize this reward. On the other hand, uh, we uh, might be uncertain about the rewards to come from some actions. And uh, we, during the learning process, uh, it's uh, uh, Kind of, it, we need to balance this uh, exploration and exploitation. And the, solving this problem is not uh, trivial. And uh, that's, again, an open problem in uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, with that, uh, let's have a look uh, like at some successes of reinforcement learning to basically motivate uh, why would we even uh, go to this uh, uh, trouble of overcoming all of this, those numerous challenges. Uh, so our first example here is a, a success of uh, reinforcement learning in this Atari gaming environments. Uh, there are like a lot of this uh, uh, pixel games uh, from Atari. And uh, it was shown in uh, 2015 uh, that uh, it is possible to uh, train an agent uh, to play this uh, games and uh, successfully uh, only from the pixel input. And uh, that was an example of uh, successful, uh, the first uh, successful uh, application of uh, deep Q learning. And after that, there was a lot of uh, like uh, improvements over th that. Uh, but essentially, the idea is it, that it was shown that it is possible to. Uh, learn to solve the task relying only on this uh, visual representation of the environment. 
And before before that, uh, this kind of tasks were only uh, solved uh, using some uh, kind of more efficient uh, representation of the game. So if, if you uh, think about it, th there is some like uh, uh, internal state of the game, which can be used to decide on the actions. But uh, we, after applying deep uh, reinforcement learning, uh, it, it was shown that it is possible uh, to solve it from only from the images. And we want to do that because this brings us uh, closer to the real world uh, scenario. So if you, if you think about uh, what kind of problems do we want to solve in real in the real world, it might be like self driving. It might be uh, the control of uh, uh, robots that will be uh, that will be operating in some dangerous environments. And for all uh, those kind of tasks, uh, we most likely need to receive our raw uh, visual and uh, maybe some other observations and uh, to uh, decide uh, which actions to take based, based on those observations. And uh, so that, that was a very important step towards uh, like pop popularization of uh, deep uh, reinforcement learning and uh, like showing that it is possible to uh, deploy uh, the, some of these algorithms in the real world relatively soon. Uh, so the next uh, like famous success was AlphaGo, and it was uh, followed by Alpha AlphaGo Zero, and uh, then Alpha Zero. So. Uh, uh, this uh, was from OpenAI and uh, on uh, from DeepMind, and they managed to uh, solve uh, this uh, to beat the human world champions in game uh, of Go. And uh, this game is uh, kind of uh, uh, why this game is interesting because it's it was uh, proven to be really hard to. Uh, so to win this game, uh, to, to play this game at human level with, without reinforcement learning by designing some uh, uh, kind of heuristic uh, uh, searches, searching algorithms, uh, which uh, had some success in chess, for example. But uh, in Go, it wasn't uh, possible. It's quite hard to represent uh, the state in a, a way uh, to uh, achieve good performance. And here uh, the like sequence was uh, the AlphaGo was using a lot of uh, uh, history from human players. So it was initialized uh, by imitating uh, world-class uh, human players and uh, then applying reinforcement learning and uh, uh, that uh, shown great results, but uh, the next step was AlphaGo Zero, uh, where it was shown that uh, the model trained uh, with no uh, human expert data entirely from self-play can outperform uh, the model that was initialized with human expert data. And uh, the uh, next uh, step, this alpha zero uh, shows that the same framework can be applied to solve a wide variety of tasks, not only the uh, this uh, particular Go game, but this basically the same framework can be applied to solve a, a range of uh, tasks. And uh, the uh, next. Uh, step here is uh, that OpenAI uh, developed uh, agents that were able to uh, successfully play uh, this Dota game. Uh, and uh, here the environment uh, has much more degrees of freedom. Uh, and 
so still uh, you can see that the first uh, step was uh, uh, like one-on-one uh, -on -one plane and uh, uh, the next step was five, five versus five. And uh, as we increase the number of uh, players involved, it uh, becomes uh, harder and harder because uh, there is more uh, like more uh, degrees of uh, variation uh, to what can happen. And uh, again, this is interesting because it moves us towards uh, uh, the real world uh, just to sol solving real world problems and uh, as, as of my knowledge uh, so now uh, this uh, uh, open ai agents can beat uh, the human champions in this uh, game and uh, so the, the game is quite complex and number of uh, possible decisions you can make is uh, really uh, so, so big that it is uh, quite hard to solve it. Okay, and um, here is another example uh, of deep, deep reinforcement learning success. So uh, this now is from, uh, from this uh, research group uh, in Berkeley uh, and uh, they trained uh, the agents uh, to uh, so the locomotion agents and you can see here that uh, uh, so what what's interesting here is that the same algorithm can be applied uh, to uh, learn uh, the to, to learn to move for different uh, Agents. So it's not only this kind of uh, human-like robot. Uh, the same algorithm can uh, can be applied uh, to solve uh, this uh, problem of moving forward for uh, robots with uh, very different uh, configurations. So here you can see the, this spider-like. Uh, uh, robot uh, moving and uh, you can see uh, how the trade as uh, number of iteration uh, grows the robot moves better and faster and more robust so that's quite interesting and uh, also This approach can be used to uh, solve a wide variety of tasks. So not only uh, we can learn to move, but here you can see uh, that uh, the robot can learn to do a lot of uh, very different movements like backflip, dancing, and uh, jumping, uh, walking, running, uh, all, all, all kinds of stuff. So that's uh, uh, pre pretty cool. And again, uh, this, uh, this robot has a lot of uh, degrees of freedom and uh, it's quite hard to like hard code uh, any of these uh, behaviors, but it is possible to learn those. That, that's, uh, that kind of might be pro proven to be very useful. Uh, yeah, and uh, another, okay, so this one is not available. So let's just move forward here. Uh, yeah, so uh, another example, which I wasn't able to show because the video wouldn't play was robot manipulation and we will probably see uh, some of those later on. Uh, so what's the problem with all of, all of this? Uh, it's uh, data inefficiency. So all of this algorithm uh, require a, lo a loss of data to learn and uh, that happens because uh, the reinforcement learning itself is uh, th there is a lot of variance to this uh, uh, updates that we uh, get from uh, reinforcement learning objective. 
So uh, how can we uh, maybe improve this data efficiency? And here uh, the representation learning uh, can come in handy. So uh, in uh, this lecture, a uh, number of applications of representation learning is covered. And uh, today we will go through this auxiliary losses example and through uh, state representation uh, learning uh, covered in the first uh, hour or so of the lecture. So uh, the first example here is uh, this auxiliary losses. And this uh, is from a paper from DeepMind uh, called the engine is called Un Unreal Agent. And uh, it, uh, so we will look at the setting. Yeah, so the name Unreal Agent comes from unsuperv unsupervised reinforcement and auxiliary uh, learning. And uh, they managed to improve uh, data effi efficiency uh, 10 times uh, compared to the baseline in this DeepMind environments. And uh, they also managed to get the 60% improvement uh, over the baseline. So uh, let's take a look at a setup. So we have uh, this uh, uh, A3C algorithm is a classic uh, or maybe like a commonly used uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, this is uh, asynchronous extra critic algorithm. Uh, so maybe to uh, give you some uh, perspective on uh, uh, what it means. Uh, so uh, uh, when we have uh, this reinforcement learning task, we can uh, do two things. Uh, basically, we can learn a function that maps each state uh, to a certain or each state action pair uh, to some uh, value. Uh, which predicts how uh, how much return uh, we will get from um, uh, follow, following the policy starting from that uh, state or state action pair. And that uh, would be value-based uh, learning method. Another uh, thing we can do is uh, policy learning. So we can directly uh, try to learn the policy. Uh, so we will... Uh, take the observation and map it into actions uh, directly. And uh, in uh, different scenarios, uh, either of this can be, uh, can have its uh, benefits. And there is uh, this actor critic uh, approach uh, when actor is basically a policy network, uh, which uh, learns to predict uh, the actions. And uh, critic is a value network which uh, learns to predict uh, the value associated with, with each uh, uh, state or state action uh, pair uh, and so on. And uh, then we can use uh, the value function uh, learned by critic to uh, improve the learning uh, process of for uh, the ac actor. So the, for the policy network. And um, this A3C, you can see that uh, it uses uh, like LSTM or some kind of recurrent uh, model uh, to uh, here uh, to learn this value and policy uh, networks. And um, yeah, that's uh, the high level overview of this uh, A3C algorithm. Uh, so the, uh, some problems here is that this should be on policy algorithm. So it needs to, uh, we, we can only learn uh, on the actual uh, uh, 
like observation. So uh, to learn to improve the policy, we need to uh, use the data generated by that policy. Uh, and that's, that's a problem uh, because uh, essentially we cannot reuse uh, all the old data uh, for this uh, algorithm. And uh, generating a new data might be computationally uh, expensive, right? Uh, so the, we need to run this uh, simulator and uh, Imagine we want to learn uh, like a real world robot, so it, it would require uh, the real, real world interactions. Uh, but uh, what was proposed here, so we uh, use uh, this uh, policy to generate some uh, episodes. We store uh, those episodes into a replay buffer, and then we can use uh, this data from a replay buffer to uh, improve uh, our network uh, using this auxiliary tasks. And uh, here, uh, let's discuss uh, this auxiliary tasks in uh, more detail. Uh, so, and uh, the benefit of this approach is it can, it's kind of uh, agnostic to what kind of uh, uh, specific reinforcement learning algorithm we use here. It can be used with uh, other uh, reinforcement learning algorithms um, by using the same kind of ideas. So again, uh, the like basic here is this uh, SVC uh, agent learning in the environment. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, this is a famous uh, Lecake, uh, which uh, shows the, like this learning uh, as a cake and the reinfor reinforcement learning being a cherry on top of it. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Peter Abil uh, makes kind of a, a lot of uh, references to this uh, la cake, uh, which are kind of uh, his uh, interpretations of that. So uh, here is so we can turn cake into so we have this uh, sparse uh, scalar reward signal. Uh, uh, which can be like viewed here as a cherry, uh, but uh, what if we put a lot of cherries on the cake? And uh, that's uh, kind of uh, this unreal agent approach, I guess. Uh, so uh, we can come up with uh, auxiliary tasks. Uh, so here, uh, this agent, agent uh, learns a policy to optimize the reward. And uh, here the reward might be like, uh, picking up this apples uh, in a maze, uh, but uh, we can easily construct uh, some uh, different auxiliary tasks. And uh, one of the auxiliary tasks they used and that worked well was uh, this pixel control. Uh, so the idea here, we uh, given some state, uh, we want to output an action that will result in uh, the uh, in some change on the of the uh, output of the network uh, when once we apply uh, a decoder so here um, again let's look we have this convolutional neural net which encodes the state into some uh, hidden representation. And we have this recurrent neural network that uh, uh, kind of accumulates the history, uh, allowing us to predict uh, the next state, uh, next hidden state from the previous observation, uh, given the, uh, yeah, given the previous observation and, and an action. And uh, then we can uh, attach here the decoder, uh, which uh, takes a hidden state and uh, uh, outputs the reconstruction. But uh, instead of uh, 
making like a full reconstruction, we can uh, kind of simplify this uh, a bit. Uh, we So here, as it's shown, we can uh, divide the space into like coarse uh, uh, state representation and uh, make some uh, kind of here, it uh, kind of shows uh, like the three by three uh, coarse uh, grained uh, uh, representation. And we can uh, construct a task uh, Per, per, what they precisely used in this paper, they uh, try to learn to uh, change, uh, like to make the maximal possible change in the pixel values. So, for example, uh, what we will, what the, what this uh, part of network will try to do, it will try to find an action that kind of changes the, the next observation in a way that uh, the pixel values on this coarse grained representation will be uh, uh, will be uh, as far from the previous one as possible. And uh, by doing that, uh, we kind of learn uh, to operate in the environment uh, with uh, in kind of reward agnostic way, right? So we, uh, Basically, instead of learning uh, to pick up, uh, to take the actions that lead to a reward, which are sparse, uh, we learn to take an action uh, that can uh, uh, just uh, provide, like, produce a specific output. And uh, that, this uh, adds a lot of uh, like uh, feedback learning feedback for this uh, encoder and LSTM networks so that we are, uh, that we want to get, right? So that's uh, the auxiliary uh, control uh, tasks. The, another thing they, they've done here, they, Another like uh, auxiliary task is a reward prediction task. Uh, so given a sequence of uh, observations, the goal is to predict uh, whether we will get uh, the a reward uh, from uh, like uh, will will the reward uh, follow this sequence of, of observations or not. And uh, again, uh, this is used to uh, speed up uh, the learning of this uh, encoder network. And uh, here you can see that uh, completely like separate uh, dense neural network is used to predict uh, this reward given uh, a sequence of hidden states. And uh, for, for that task, we can, uh, uh, skew our sampling. So we can sample uh, sequences from replay buffer in, in a way that uh, positive and uh, zero rewards are balanced. Uh, so in, in the real uh, like rollouts, the rewards are sparse. But uh, for this uh, uh, part of training, uh, we can resample the, the, we can sample from the replay buffer the data which is balanced. And again, it improves our uh, uh, learning efficiency for this encoder network. And uh, uh, next scene is uh, this uh, value function replay task. Uh, and here the goal is to uh, uh, speed up uh, learning this value function specifically. So. Uh, this uh, uh, extra critic uh, learning happens on policy, but we can uh, do value function uh, learning uh, using the data from replay buffer, and that would be off policy. Uh, so, so that's uh, another uh, scene uh, which we will not probably go into details of it, but uh, uh, combining all of this uh, three, uh, kind of improvements over the original A3C uh, algorithm, uh, you can see that uh, the authors were able to get much uh, uh, better performance compared to the baseline. So here, this uh, 
a gray, a gray line in uh, at the bottom is uh, original A3C uh, learning agent, and uh, the blue line at the top is uh, Unreal agent, which combines uh, this uh, auxiliary control, auxiliary uh, reward prediction, and uh, value replay tasks. So. They all, the authors of this paper also explored uh, a space of possible uh, auxiliary, ta auxiliary control tasks. So uh, what, what they used, uh, what produced the best results was this pixel control. Uh, another thing one can do is a feature control uh, that uh, would be so the, the intuition here is uh, we want to learn uh, this uh, encoder uh, in a way that the hidden state represents uh, all the useful information uh, about uh, our environment, uh, which is needed to do this, uh, to produce the actions. And uh, we can try to learn uh, to instead of man manipulating pixels in pixel space, uh, we can uh, do the same with feature, like what action will result in a maxim maximal change in the feature space. Uh, but as you can see, the pixel control tasks task produce uh, slightly better results. Another uh, scene uh, that was uh, explored here was uh, the comparison of different auxiliary tasks. So we have this uh, pixel control task uh, uh, that we introduced and uh, they compare uh, uh, that with uh, uh, input reconstruction uh, auxiliary task and uh, input change uh, input uh, change prediction uh, auxiliary task. And uh, the pixel control tasks perform uh, performing the best uh, produces the best score. And uh, the reason for for that uh, would be like uh, for for example for input reconstruction, uh, which might seem to be like a harder task in a way. So we want to if we want to reconstruct a full input. Uh, and uh, that that would be like learning the model of the environment. Uh, the pixel control task helps the, us to learn how the actions of the agent impact uh, the the environment. So instead of learning the model of the environment, we uh, learn to operate in this environment. So that's uh, the like possible explanation offered here. And uh, yeah, so uh, there are some uh, examples of limitations uh, of this uh, approach uh, as well, maybe uh, for, for, but uh, again, so uh, the, the, there is this game Montezuma's Revenge, uh, which, uh, was uh, particularly challenging for uh, uh, like bare A3C approach, but with this uh, auxiliary tasks, it was uh, possible to uh, get better score uh, in, in this game. And uh, here you can uh, see in dashed line, I believe these are the best performing uh, agents. Uh, and you can see that there is a lot of variance. So some agents uh, uh, learn to perform quite uh, well, while others probably produce a zero reward here. And uh, but the original uh, actor critic approach uh, wasn't able to solve this uh, uh, problem at all. And that uh, happens because uh, in th this in environment, uh, it's it's kind of uh, the, the pass from action uh, from actions to getting a reward is not obvious. Yeah, but uh, again, that's kind of um, a bit uh, 
the details of it is a bit out of scope of this lecture, but uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if I can. Well, uh, I'm not sure if I can play this video, but whatever. Yeah, so here is like a summary of uh, the uh, of the task as a total learning objective would be uh, would consist of uh, the basic A3C uh, loss and uh, plus uh, three additional loss components uh, weighted by some uh, lambda factors here. And uh, yeah, so the details uh, of the tasks uh, we already discussed. And again, uh, the uh, com comparison of uh, the results from uh, on Atari. Again, this Unreal Agent uh, performs uh, best compared to other approaches. But again, as you can see, uh, uh, there is uh, like a lot of variation here. And uh, in this case, uh, the difference is not uh, so big, probably, uh, as compared to the previous uh, environment. And uh, another scene the authors explored is uh, robustness. So uh, here, uh, these plots show uh, a uh, like a fraction of agents uh, performing, uh, uh, like uh, giving, uh, producing some uh, performance, right? So that's, uh, for example. Uh, here, uh, like it, it's shown that 20% uh, of, of Unreal agents were able to achieve uh, like around 75% uh, of human normalized performance on this particular uh, task. And uh, so uh, this shows that uh, uh, when you apply this uh, Unreal uh, learning algorithm, uh, you get uh, the best uh, like of uh, best percentage of population performing well and uh, yeah another like scene you can see from this plot that uh, there, there is a, like a lot of variation uh, across the agents so some some agents uh, uh, learn to perform quite well, uh, while other agents uh, uh, just fail to learn. Okay, so that was uh, quite detailed um, uh, presentation of this Unreal uh, uh, agent. And uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to jump in. And, Ask now, and the next we will uh, move to uh, how how can we leverage uh, state representation uh, to improve the data efficiency of reinforcement learning. Uh, so the first idea here uh, is uh, mapping observations to state. So uh, we try to learn from this uh, high dimensional uh, images and uh, to do it uh, efficiently we want to map uh, this uh, high dimensional inputs into some uh, kind of low dimensional latent representation uh, that will be useful for uh, learning and uh, uh, we will now discuss this idea of world models uh, and uh, here is a picture from the one of the most uh, 
famous papers in this uh, direction. So uh, here uh, the framework would be, uh, we have an environment which produces some uh, observations that the images, then we have a variational autoencoder, uh, which should uh, encode the frames into some hidden state Z uh, in a way that uh, the uh, reconstructions are good. And uh, then we can uh, use that hidden state uh, for as input to the rec recurrent uh, neural network, uh, which will uh, produce uh, the, which will learn the latent uh, uh, dynamics of the environment. So uh, instead of learning like a dynamics in the pixel uh, space, uh, we are, what we are trying to do, we are trying to learn the dynamics in the latent space. And uh, uh, this is uh, this model is uh, like MDN RNN, where MDN stands for mixture density network. So uh, the model outputs not uh, and not uh, uh, like uh, concrete uh, hidden state, but it it rather predicts uh, uh, distribution. Uh, Probability, probability distribution over, over hidden state. So this uh, stochastic output, stochastic network. So, and uh, the uh, to total like for learning framework then would be, uh, we use this uh, variational autoencoder to get the hidden representations and we use uh, a, a recurrent neural uh, network the model uh, to model the latent uh, dynamics. And on top of that, we can uh, train a simple uh, controller that will uh, produce a distribution of our actions. So this is a policy uh, network here. And we use, uh, so this is a small uh, fully connected network. We use uh, this uh, hidden state, uh, and uh, latent representation of current state and the hidden state of the uh, recurrent uh, neural network uh, as input to this uh, uh, controller. All right, and then we can uh, apply uh, this actions uh, in in environment, and also we want to learn uh, uh, this recurrent neural network uh, in a way that it it is uh, it predicts the next uh, uh, hidden state uh, given uh, current observation and an action, right? And uh, what we can do then we can just learn in this uh, uh, hidden uh, like by by we can learn in this latent space instead of uh, learning from actual observations, we, when we have a good uh, uh, latent uh, state space uh, model, uh, we can uh, just uh, produce a sequence of uh, uh, hidden states and uh, improve the learning in that way. So they applied uh, this to this car racing environment. Uh, so uh, the pipeline here would be uh, first uh, they collected uh, some data using random policy and use the data to learn uh, the uh, to train this variational autoencoder and uh, then they uh, used it to train uh, this uh, recurrent neural network. And uh, after that, uh, they uh, trained uh, uh, this linear controller uh, using uh, this uh, latent state, uh, latent uh, uh, state uh, transition model, right? And uh, here, uh, 
another reference to this Lacake here, the controller, which is learned using, uh, which is trained using reinforcement learning. Uh, the total count of parameters of controller is uh, very small compared to the number of parameters in uh, uh, variational autoencoder and in the recurrent neural net. Uh, and uh, essentially, this means that we need uh, much less uh, kind of uh, data to train the controller uh, because it has less parameters. Yeah, and um, here is an example of uh, reconstruction uh, of uh, the frame uh, from uh, from this latent representation uh, that were used to, uh, again. Uh, it was shown that uh, having this. Uh, so here. Uh, the thing is you cannot predict uh, the next uh, frame uh, using only the special input, uh, which is uh, output of the encoder of uh, uh, variational autoencoder, right, right? So Z, uh, because it does not contain all the information we need uh, to uh, predict the next state, because uh, we need to have some uh, uh, like notion of what happened before. And uh, the recurrent neural network hidden state uh, helps with that. So it would encode the history essentially. And that is uh, useful for predicting the next state. And uh, uh, what they managed uh, to achieve, uh, they've uh, beaten all the previous uh, attempts on this environment. Uh, you can see they out outperform some uh, this DQN, uh, which is kind of uh, the first kind of naive approach. Uh, they also outperform uh, this uh, A3C, which is a popular uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah, and another algorithms uh, as well. So uh, let's look at uh, some uh, details here. Uh, so the controller uh, will be trained. Uh, so uh, what we want to like improve here, we want to improve data efficiency. Uh, that uh, we will not need to run a simulator as many times, uh, which means uh, like less compute uh, needed to produce this. So once we have uh, trained this uh, 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 recurrent uh, state space model, uh, we can, uh, so given some, uh, first frame, we can uh, kind of produce a sequence of uh, possible uh, frame, uh, next uh, hidden states. And uh, here, as you can see, we have this uh, uh, mixture density network on top of uh, RNN, uh, which makes uh, this uh, uh, hidden state. Uh, so instead of producing like a, uh, concrete prediction, we produce a uh, uh, distribution, probabilistic distribution of a possible uh, states here. And uh, then, uh, yeah, so we map this uh, like concrete hidden state into uh, stochastic latent variable. Then we use uh, the hidden state and uh, uh, latent variable as input to the controller, uh, right? And uh, then we feedback the action produced by controller to the RNN as well as a, a previous hidden state, to, and uh, we do it in like in, a, in this uh, yeah recurrent fashion. 
So, um, uh, yeah, they also applied the same approach uh, to other environments. So here is uh, this doom take over environment. Uh, and uh, one of the problems here is this uh, is that this uh, uh, latent uh, space models are not uh, like uh, precise, right? So we can uh, uh, produce some hidden states uh, that do not uh, actually correspond uh, to uh, well, uh, like well-defined uh, uh, spe states in the actual environment. And uh, this um, allows uh, to get some kind of adversarial control, which leads uh, our latent uh, space model into this regions where the predictions are not that good. And uh, that results, uh, let me find the, so that, that, that might result in uh, a following problem. Uh, so uh, that would uh, correspond to the first rows here. Uh, you can see that uh, the virtual score, uh, so the vir virtual score here is a, a score that agent managed to achieve uh, inside this uh, uh, generated, uh, the and like transition generated by the, uh, by the learned uh, uh, like a latent space model. And uh, this doesn't uh, transfer well to, uh, to the actual score. And uh, why does this happen? Just maybe I can open this site. Here they have a, a very nice uh, website uh, with uh, interactive uh, demos. So uh, one of the problems here is that with uh, this uh, uh, temperature parameter is used to control uh, the generation of uh, hidden states. And uh, let me try to find it. So uh, they found they found that uh, okay, so here is uh, like a video for this. Uh, uh, Doom takeover game. Uh, so there are like some kind of enemies that are shooting fireballs into uh, a player, and the player need to uh, avoid the fireballs. So uh, here you can see. Uh, a problem uh, that uh, comes with uh, having a low temperature. Let's set a temperature to uh, like lower values. And uh, you can see that uh, there are no fireballs here. And uh, obviously that's why the agent uh, gets a very high score uh, in this uh, uh, latent, uh, oh, like a simulated uh, uh, model, right? But uh, it doesn't transfer to the real environment uh, because it haven't learned anything useful. So let's now change a temperature to be about one. Uh, you can see that the uh, samples are now uh, like more blurry here, so some uh, enemies appear and disappear, uh, but now we have some uh, fireballs uh, coming occasionally. And as we increase uh, temperature a bit uh, more, now there are uh, 
more of these fireballs. And now agent learns to avoid the fireballs, which is useful uh, for the actual environment. So back to this uh, table here. So they found that uh, the low temperatures uh, resulted in this mode collapse when uh, no fireballs are generated. So the uh, basically the uh, latent dynamics is uh, isn't that uh, good, uh, and uh, agent gets a very high score, uh, close to perfect in. Uh, this simulated environment, but uh, has a poor score in actual environment. And uh, as we increase the temperature, make the uh, which would make the output of this uh, mixture density model more uh, kind of uncertain, uh, we get to the point where the uh, score in uh, si simulated like virtual environment. Uh, transfers well to the actual environment. And you can see here that it was able to achieve even higher score in actual environment compared to the virtual one. All right, so that's an interesting observation. And uh, another thing that uh, is uh, that can be done here. Uh, we can iterate this procedure. So we uh, start with a random uh, model, uh, like world model and uh, controller. And uh, we generate some uh, samples. Uh, then we, once we have improved the model and controller, we uh, generate new rollouts and uh, do it iteratively and that improves uh, the results. Right, and uh, there are a number of uh, papers uh, that uh, follow the same uh, kind of uh, line of work. So that's like an active area of research yeah, and uh, you can visit this uh, website to play around with uh, stuff here. Yeah, they have some uh, demonstration of the learned policies in action and uh, yeah, quite a bunch of uh, All right. Okay, so uh, next idea here uh, is this embed to control paper, and it is uh, quite old, I guess. It's from uh, 2016, I think. Uh, so the idea here is uh, to uh, learn this uh, latent space in a way that it is uh, easy for control. And uh, what actually, uh, so what they done, they consider this uh, uh, set of uh, rather simple environments here. You can see that uh, there are relatively low dimensional images and this are kind of classic uh, environment. So uh, what they want to do, they want to uh, learn this uh, locally linear latent space model, and then uh, we can apply uh, optimal control uh, to the latent space uh, model uh, to uh, produce good results. Uh, so. Uh, optimal control. So for, for linear models, uh, one can find this optimal control just uh, this, uh, from classic control theory uh, by uh, optimizing uh, an objective. And this is well-defined uh, task, uh, uh, which has a, a strong theoretical uh, background. 
but uh, for for it to be to work well, we need uh, a, local, a locally linear dynamics model. So what they did in this paper, they tried to uh, embed this nonlinear uh, pictorial representation of the environment into a low dimensional uh, hidden uh, space that is uh, easy to linearize. And we will uh, look at the details, uh, how, how it works. So uh, essentially once we have, uh, we want to produce this a and B, uh, which are just matrices uh, that define the dynamics of the uh, of the environment, uh, and uh, this A matrix will uh, define how uh, how the transitions happen, and uh, so this would be like state transition matrix, and uh, B uh, defines how the control is influencing the uh, dynamics. So uh, once we have this uh, uh, two matrices, we can solve the quadratic uh, criterion function and uh, find the optimal control. So now uh, to the, let's consider the requirements. Uh, to uh, enable this uh, optimal uh, optimal control. So this, uh, for example, uh, one can use uh, ILQR, which is iterative uh, linear quadratic regulator, and uh, that's uh, kind of a result well, uh, well defined, uh, well studied uh, result from classical control theory, uh, which allows to find this optimal control. Uh, for linear uh, dynamics uh, systems, linear dynamic systems, uh, by optimizing this quadratic crit uh, criteria. So uh, what we need uh, to find, uh, we need to uh, find a, a latent space uh, that uh, captures sufficient information about the observation. Uh, here denoted as X. So we want to, uh, for, for that, we can use this like autoencoding uh, framework here, right? So uh, the fact that we can uh, reconstruct the observation from its hidden representation uh, means that we capture en enough information about it. Uh, uh, also, we need uh, to have accurate uh, long-term prediction. So we want this model to be uh, uh, cons con consistently uh, predict of the correct uh, uh, hidden states or latent states uh, for a long sequences of actions. So that's uh, that can be done by uh, uh, like considering a longer uh, rollouts here. So we uh, simulate the dynamics uh, for a number of steps uh, just uh, in, in this hidden hidden space. Uh, and then we want to, once we reconstruct the uh, final uh, this latent space representation, we want to obtain uh, some um, value Right, and we uh, in, in that way we can define uh, the uh, target uh, in in this latent space. Right, so uh, we to apply this iterative uh, linear quadratic regulator uh, algorithm, we we want to define a target in this uh, uh, latent space. Right, and. Uh, the predictions must be linearly, uh, linear, uh, locally linearizable. And uh, so if we can uh, learn such a latent representation, then we can solve the uh, uh, optimal, uh, the control problem using the optimal control. So 
uh, now let's uh, consider how this uh, challenges are solved in the, in this E2C paper. Uh, so to uh, model the dynamic, we use uh, um, we use a variational autoencoder as usual, uh, and again we have uh, we like produce this uh, hidden state. Then we uh, ensure the uh, like this self consistency that the uh, reconstruction is correct, and also we want uh, to make sure that the uh, prediction of the next state uh, is also reconstructed into correct uh, observation. And uh, to produce this uh, like next observation, we want to learn this uh, uh, linear model. And uh, to ensure the linearity, we just we are learning to predict this A and B matrices that will describe the dynamics of the system. All right, and uh, so here uh, we learned this other like network to predict uh, this matrices here. So this is a total learning objective, uh, which uh, consists of uh, the kind of reconstructions and also this uh, uh, maximum maximum likelihood uh, training objective here. So yeah, I think that was covered in the slide. Okay, we have this uh, like transition model and uh, again it's it, it is a like a stochastic model so we uh, like we predict the distribution of our possible values rather than uh, like a concrete values and uh, we uh, again we need this model to be uh, Consistent uh, for long term, uh, or, uh, for like long horizon rollouts, because uh, a small uh, change, like small variations in uh, uh, this hidden state, uh, will result in divergence. So here, if we if you make a small error in the, at the first step, then uh, we kind of magnify it uh, after each step, and we. Uh, and uh, cannot produce uh, good results in that way. Therefore, uh, they add this long-term consistency uh, objective. Uh, here you can see this third component, uh, which is a K KL divergence uh, for this to uh, like predicted and uh, actual, uh, uh, so the, the pred predicted uh, latent representation and uh, the uh, encoded uh, actual observation. Right, so the uh, final framework here, uh, we want to uh, capture uh, sufficient information about the observation, which is done by autoencoder. Uh, we want to get uh, accurate long-term predictions uh, of latent state that is done by adding this uh, uh, KL term uh, for the latent uh, predictions and uh, encodings of uh, next observation. And uh, the this linear, linearizability is ensured by the design. So we just train the model to predict uh, this uh, like 
matrices, which are a linear model of transition here. So that's just, uh, uh, it, it is easy to linearize because uh, we train a model in a way that it, it is possible to produce this uh, like linear transformation that maps uh, the previous state to the next state. All right, so essentially we can see that there are three components to this uh, model and uh, Here are some uh, like results. So, uh, for for example, you can see that there is uh, like a nice uh, long term uh, consistency here. Uh, it uh, the the predictions like uh, respond to actions quite quite well. So, for example, given no actions. Uh, uh, model, you can see just a slight drift here. And uh, when, you, when you have the action, you have you can see that uh, the uh, generated uh, reconstructions may match quite well the actual observations. All right, so they report some results here and uh, er, the re results were all right i think at the time can yeah um can it, maybe i can uh, do is to open the video if it wouldn't play from this uh, Google slides, maybe we can find. Yeah. Dynamics is close to linear. Mm. I think it's fully control uh, kind of tasks. Let's take a look at how all this works. Success, showing that the tricks. And here's what the environments look like. Uh, this is from raw images. So what we're watching is effectively also what the agent sees, the, the, um, the environments themselves. So real image on the left, district on the right. And here we have cardboard balancing in action. And so this gives you some idea of how capable this approach is. So it does very well at the same time. Right, so that's um, like this algorithm in action. Um, let's go back to the uh, next idea here in this uh, space. So uh, they, uh, in the previous paper, they tried to learn uh, a single uh, linear um, model to represent the state, but uh, in for more complex environments, uh, uh, there are probably there is probably no a single linear model to represent uh, dynamics uh, properly. So. Uh, What uh, the next paper, this uh, solar uh, paper tries to do, they uh, actually learn a set of uh, linear models uh, that are uh, state dependent. So we will uh, have a set of linear models uh, that uh, correspond to different uh, states of the system. And uh, Okay, I just to work. So that's something. Okay, let's just uh, again uh, skip over a little bit. 
time varying linear models, you cover more of them just spit at the same time and maybe benefit the policy and the repeat. And this can actually learn in about 20 minutes to stack it like a block, uh, learning it from, from pixels as input. Okay, yeah, so no. I don't know, the, uh, sorry, the videos from the slides, I don't know why they wouldn't play, but okay. Uh, so let's continue on. Uh, yeah, just uh, feel free to jump in if you have any questions. And uh, next we will cover just uh, quickly. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of different, there are a lot of different approaches uh to like variations of the approaches uh to this to solving this kind of problem and uh, we will just uh, see a brief uh, summary of each of those so for example uh here is uh, this uh, deep special uh, special outer encoders the image uh, is uh, are represented as a like uh, is recomputed by this uh, 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 convolutional network, and uh, what uh, we are going to get here. Uh, so each uh, so we have uh, like sixteen uh, uh, channels. At the end, then we apply a soft marks uh, over channels, and uh, this uh, gets us uh, the most activated uh, pixels here. And those pixels uh, should correspond to objects uh, in in the original image. And uh, once we have this uh, special representation of the scene. Uh, we can uh, apply uh, control using those uh, uh, features, right? Uh, and uh, again, uh, one can use uh, like a, a model base RL uh, using this iterative linear quadratic regulator in this Latin space. And uh, yeah, the Latin space is useful because it uh, produces this. Uh, can just set of uh, positions of the objects in 2D space. So it's easy to use. Uh, another approach, which is uh, like different here, uh, instead of uh, learning a good representation through reconstructions, uh, one can uh, try to learn the representation using some uh, physics priors. Uh, so for example, uh, here uh, we know that uh, a velocity is a, is a change in position. And uh, so uh, we know that this uh, observations uh, co like correspond to some uh, physical laws that control the actual environment. And uh, they produced a set of uh, uh, loss uh, functions uh, that can be used to uh, learn good representations. And uh, for, so here we have that, uh, for example, our representations for, for two uh, different images should be far apart. So here, a loss component that ensures that, uh, but also the change in position between two consecutive frames should be small. And uh, here's the loss that uh, ensures that. Also change in, in velocity for uh, like, for this, uh, in this uh, state representation should be also small. And, uh, we know that there is a conservation of uh, momentum and uh, this loss encodes that. And uh, we also want uh, this state space uh, to be uh, 
useful to produce control. Uh, so uh, here is this loss that uh, is here to make sure that the ob obtained system is controllable. Okay, so uh, in, the, in this case, again, we uh, basically map uh, the observation using some neural network to a low dimensional uh, representation, which will encode the positions of objects. Then we obtain this uh, kind of uh, state that corresponds to velocity. And then we use that, to, uh, this uh, set of uh, uh, loss functions to uh, train this neural network to map into the proper uh, hidden state. Another interesting uh, paper here, uh, this disentangled representation learning agent. Uh, this was a study of uh, transferability in, at, in reinforcement learning. Uh, so uh, they, what they did, uh, they used this ideas from uh, uh, beta AVAE paper uh, to learn the disentangled representations of uh, hidden hidden state. So, right, so huh. okay, so the videos wouldn't play, unfortunately. Uh, but the the thing here is uh, that. Uh, uh, by uh, making sure that we learn the disentangled uh, representation of hidden space, we uh, make sure that uh, the once we change some aspects of the environment that are not relevant to the task at hand. Uh, for example, here uh, the task is the same. We need to. Uh, like gather uh, some kind of objects uh, and avoid the other kinds. Uh, and what what is changed is that we change uh, uh, colors of, of the objects and colors of the walls here and the floor. So uh, this is kind of irrelevant for the agent and the agent that can uh, operate in uh, this uh, environment with uh, a yellow uh, or orange or brown floor and uh, green walls should be also able to operate in environment with blue floor and uh, uh, red walls. And uh, they have shown that by uh, uh, using this uh, beta VAE framework, they can uh, transfer policies. So they can learn policies that are uh, kind of independent uh, of the irrelevant details of the environment. Okay, and um, interesting. So that's, uh, seems seem to be a final slide. So let me just a second to the set of slides here uh, on G slides is, seems to be not complete. So let me open the PDF version of it. Uh, just a moment. Okay, so uh,
Okay. Oh, sorry for the delay. Let me share my screen again. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, All right, so that uh, continues the next uh, presented approach was using this uh, infogen. Uh, and uh, in this case, we are uh, modifying this, this is a modified version of infogen, uh, which is causal infogen. For reinforcement learning, uh, we uh, want not only to make, uh, to make sure that the uh, representations of the uh, state are consistent, uh, like uh, we have a good representation of a state, uh, but also we want to make sure that there is uh, this uh, time consistency be between con uh, consecutive representation. And uh, here is this variation of infogen that uh, takes uh, a state and uh, a next state, which is uh, kind of sampled here from the transition model, and make sure that the, uh, the two uh, observations produced by a generator here are uh, consistent. So um, uh, instead of uh, uh, discriminating if the image is real or not, uh, we discriminate if the pair of observations is uh, real or not so we in in this way the this uh, time consistency for infogan is ensured right so um, that Okay, so the next uh, paper here is uh, this uh, planet paper. Uh, so once we have learned uh, the uh, latent space dynamic models, uh, we can use it uh, for uh, planning. And uh, planning is uh, like uh, uh, improvement uh, of the uh, value and action uh, networks in like between the real environment interactions, we can uh, do their uh, rollouts in uh, the latent uh, using latent space dynamic model and uh, learn the actions and values uh, uh, using this uh, rollouts uh, of, of hidden modern model uh, and uh, the continuation of that uh, work was Dreamer. Uh, so here uh, they presented uh, an approach to learn the, uh, so we uh, train this action and uh, value models uh, completely in the uh, imagined or dreamed uh, in environments. So uh, this is like uh, similar to uh, yeah, model-based policy optimization. So we, uh, we train this uh, Latin dynamic models, which again consists of uh, the, uh, like some convolutional networks that encodes to the observation to low dimensional uh, latent state, and then we learn this uh, recurrent neural network to uh, pre to predict the next observation using uh, yeah using the latent uh, dynamics. So, and uh, there is a, a continuation. Uh, of this uh, uh, paper. So uh, here you can see the Dreamer uh, V2 and uh, the comparison. So, uh, and the comparison here is done, uh, uh, like we compare the model-based and model-free approaches. Uh, 
So the, the thing here is that model-based approaches require much uh, less uh, interactions with the in environment. Uh, so we want to improve the uh, data efficiency in, uh, in this way. Uh, so we want to minimize the number of uh, environment interactions. And uh, this, uh, in this Dreamer V2, you can see that they managed to outperform uh, uh, the model-free approaches. So And uh, the change here was uh, instead of uh, using uh, this uh, VAE, they used uh, something similar to a VQ VAE. So they quantized the latent uh, state at, uh, that uh, has uh, proven to be uh, much, uh, much better. Yeah, so the, the total, like this framework consists of a representation model, the uh, transition model, and the, and the recurrent models, which predicts uh, the, the next state, yeah, given an action and uh, previous state. So that's an interesting uh, take on uh, the model-based model RL and representation learning for model-based RL. Okay, so uh, here is another seen uh, here is this visual for sight again uh, the idea is uh, very similar here they uh, kind of learn to uh, predict uh, the next frame uh, in in the vision uh, space so uh, what we done before we uh, train the model to predict uh, the, to make predictions in uh, uh, this latent space. Uh, here they trained the model to predict uh, in this image space. Uh, okay, and uh, another interesting approach was uh, uh, to learn this uh, forward plus inverse dynamics. So uh, here it, it is, kind of uh, very hard to predict. Uh, for example, here, once you, the, uh, so it's very hard, hard to predict uh, the exact way in which the bottle will break. But uh, it's kind of, e what, what's easier to do is to predict uh, the uh, like previous uh, action and state pair uh, that pre preceded the breaking of the uh, bottle and by learning this uh, uh, forward and uh, inverse dynamics so given uh, like this two observations in this case like a uh, bottle and a broken bottle uh, we want to predict an action that will uh, result uh, the, in this observation so in this uh, pair of, of observations and uh, yeah, again, they uh, uh, managed to uh, to apply this uh, framework to learn to manipulate objects. All right. And uh, another uh, scene that we haven't. Uh, take a look at here. So uh, before the models were used to uh, predict this observations or the next uh, states, but uh, we also, what, what we also can do, we, uh, we can uh, train a model to predict uh, the rewards as well. And uh, that can be used uh, and 
that that can be very useful and that's what that's what is done in a famous famous mu zero model uh, from uh, OpenAI or not OpenAI but DeepMind and um, yeah let me just switch there is a nice uh, blog post by uh, the first author of mu zero paper and uh, here it's uh, it kind of uh, uh, describes uh, the SMU0 in uh, represents a high level overview of the SMU0 paper. So uh, what's done? What's done there? Uh, we just do this uh, Monte Carlo tree search in the Latin space. So uh, basically, we uh, again try to learn the we need uh, three components here. We need this uh, representation model that maps an observation to a latent state. Uh, we need a dynamics model that uh, maps uh, like action and uh, state into the next uh, observation, uh, into the next state. And we need this prediction model that uh, uh, pr like predicts uh, the uh, value corresponding to the state and also this uh, p-value which uh, represents the uncertainty about this uh, state which can be used to uh, do this exploration in the in the latent state and uh, as, as you might know that uh, this algorithm in general was uh, very successfully applied uh, to uh, a number of tasks uh, by DeepMind. Right, so I guess, uh, and uh, so this uh, wasn't covered in the lecture, but uh, I want, I think it would be nice to finish uh, the first half of the lecture uh, with, uh, this uh, paper called Contrast Even Supervised Representation uh, for Reinforcement Learning. And this paper is from uh, 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 Peter Abiel and uh, uh, Aravind uh, Srinivas, uh, who were both uh, like teaching this course. But I think this uh, paper was released once uh, this course was uh, like finished, I guess but it is a really uh, nice uh, demonstration of application of uh, unsupervised representation learning to reinforcement learning. And uh, it kind of highlights uh, the uh, synergy between this uh, two areas and is uh, very simple. So here, the block diagram of the framework. Uh, we have an observation and uh, we essentially apply this uh, standard uh, contrast different uh, learning uh, framework here. So we use this uh, data augmentations to produce uh, the augmented version of observation and it is encoded uh, using uh, the momentum encoder here, uh, like in MoCo, for example. Uh, and, th and then uh, we have this contrastive, uh, uh, con contrastive objective and also we use the same kind of observation from the encoder for reinforcement learning. And uh, using this uh, simple approach, we can uh, speed up uh, the encoder uh, substantially. Uh, so this is kind of uh, a nice and uh, concise uh, approach to this uh, problem and it uh, produced uh, really good results. So let me, yeah, you can see here, uh, another block diagram of the same <laughs> same thing. Actually, I, I guess 
uh, and they uh, combined it with a couple of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, including the soft actor critic algorithm and the rainbow algorithm, uh, which is actually like a, a DQN on steroids. Uh, yeah, and the uh, contrast, uh, contrastive learning objective is uh, just uh, a standard contrastive learning. We want to make sure that the uh, uh, distance uh, between the uh, query and the positive, uh, like between the positive uh, pair is uh, uh, S smaller compared to the distance between uh, negative pairs, right? So this is a contrastive learning objective they used. Yeah, the, there are like, a, so they used this uh, uh, data augmentations uh, similar to what is what's used in uh, uh, like standard uh, reinforcement learning, right? And uh, they managed to uh, produce good results in uh, in a number of uh, environments. And uh, here uh, you can see that they produced uh, comparable results uh, to. Uh, soft actor critic uh, trained from state. So this uh, final column here uh, uh, corresponds to the uh, more agents uh, trained using this uh, state representation. And uh, other uh, columns here, uh, they use this pixel representation. And uh, you can think of this uh, a score uh, for for when learning from state the good kind of uh, indicator of uh, model performance yeah and again uh, one can see that they uh, this uh, contrast the unsupervised reinforcement learning uh, produces the best uh, results in uh, five of six uh, environments they tried. And uh, they also uh, produced uh, good results uh, in uh, many of the Atari games as well. So, okay. And uh, here is a comparison of uh, the results. And again, here is the, this uh, leftmost uh, bars represent uh, the performance of uh, an agent trained uh, from a state representation, uh, which is like uh, the output of the environment and uh, you can see that uh, the, this curl uh, trend of uh, uh, 500,000 environment uh, steps produces a uh, compar uh, comparable performance uh, to this uh, uh, state uh, learning from state. So that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that might be very useful because uh, uh, obviously we don't have uh, a nice uh, low dimensional state representation for many of the interesting tasks. So as you can see that uh, now uh, the results when learning from the pixel representations or from raw images are very close to the to those uh, of uh, 
like compressed state representation or uh, like actual state representation. So I guess that's time to finish today's part of the lecture and uh, yeah, see you in a week. If you quick, have uh, any question, questions Adolf, or comments. Um, yeah. yeah, quick question just based on your um, learning into the these variety of papers, it seems like most of these techniques do one of three things. Like one is um, reduce the number of data or make like it says sample efficiency, meaning you know you don't need as much data, or they improve like the number of steps or you know speed with which you reach your goal. And then the third one would be as we saw or as you showed in the Montezuma example or uh, stuff, that it makes some things possible that were not possible, meaning you solve the problem which was unsolved before. Now, uh, is there any kind of, or based on just even your looking into these, uh, is the predominant effect of or contribution of unsupervised is in the first two domains, meaning like most of the benefits lie in either efficiency improvement and in um, speed of getting results versus actually gaining in performance or is it like more evenly distributed? Like there are as many cases where there's actual gain in performance versus just improvement in data efficiency or speed. Well, you know, it's really uh, kind of hard uh, to tell because, as you can see, uh, this uh, different approaches are uh, applied to different environments, and uh, it's sometimes it's really uh, hard to uh, compare and uh, you know to like um, make sense of uh, what's going on but uh, i guess that uh, the yeah the main the main benefit is in the in this improvement of uh, uh, sample efficiency uh, in both uh, like uh, uh, so as as you can see here uh, for example this paper is it just uh, improves the way we learn uh, the encoder, right? So the unsupervised uh, learning is used to, to speed up the learning of the encoder here. So yeah, that's, uh, and uh, yeah, many of the uh, results I, see, I think are related to, to that, but uh, also, uh, like this uh, results shown in uh, Dreamer, uh, Dreamer paper. Uh, yeah, this uh, kind of more relates to the, uh, yeah, to the fact that uh, kind of uh, we can, uh, if we can learn uh, the good model of the, uh, let, let, good latent model, model of the dynamics, then we need much less interactions. And also what we can do uh, it, so, uh, and uh, why uh, mu zero uh, performs so well, uh, because we can use this, uh, we can use this Monte Carlo tree search to improve their actual performance. Uh, so uh, often this agents operate given some uh, time budget, right? Uh, so let's, uh, for example, think about uh, chairs, right? We say we have like uh, 30 seconds to make the decision. And uh, the, the latent uh, dynamic models uh, can be used in, in approaches like mu zero. It is used uh, to uh, do this rollouts. And essentially we select the next action based on this uh, rollout. So uh, yeah, I, I guess you can improve in uh, uh, all directions. So uh, by uh, 
by uh, learning a good uh, Latin dynamic models, you can both improve the uh, sample efficiency in a, in a sense of uh, environment uh, interactions needed to train the agent as uh, like shown in this uh, dreamer approaches. So you can train in this dreamed an environment. Uh, and also you can improve the performance because you can use uh, this uh, Latin dynamic models uh, to uh, make uh, better decisions. It can uh, be sort of as like model predictive control uh, like it, it is also used in uh, classic reinforcement uh, learning. At each step, uh, you like uh, solve the uh, best action to achieve like a long-term goal. Uh, you take that action, and at, at the next time step, you kind of uh, get the new observation, and you again solve all the, solve all uh, this problem all to the end, and. Uh, yeah, essentially uh, that Im significantly improves the actual performance of the uh, algorithm. So uh, I'm not sure if I <laughs> really answered the questions, but that what I understand about it. And uh, again, this is, uh, field of reinforcement learning is by far uh, not converged. And uh, yeah, for, for example, uh, yeah, this improvement uh, from Dreamer uh, version one to Dreamer version two is uh, like very significant, uh, but uh, but they use kind of the same idea and uh, the changes are mostly uh, kind of uh, engineering, right? So I guess uh, it is po quite possible that using the same set of ideas uh, the researchers will be able to achieve uh, much better results in uh, like in all directions by uh, using these ideas in a smart way. I don't know. Great. Thanks a lot. And we'll have one more session next week. All right. See you so, all then. Thanks, Arthur. Yeah. See Thank you. you. See you next week. Bye.